but I'm currently looking at a potential short setup on the Nikkei, which is the Japanese stock market, uh, after this big rally up since uh, Friday's close. I'm looking at a possible short setup. I was doing some risk management stuff on my separate monitor. Looking to potentially short here. Um, I'm going to wait until the, the New York open in about seven minutes. And I think I'm going to take this short. And my idea here is something like this. I think I'm going to take a short right around this current levels. I want to risk about 2% from here to the upside. Not 2% of my account, 2% distance. But I kind of like the idea of potentially trying to take a stab on the short side here. Maybe a second attempt would be around this area. So keeping an eye on that. But yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a possible short with a stop loss just below here, above here. And if I get stopped out on this first attempt, my second attempt, I'm thinking right now, would be around 37.109 on the Nikkei. EWJ, so just to reiterate, 1.75% distance. So we're going to go ahead and go take a look at EWJ. 1.75 distance puts me right here. So what we want to do is create a new order with a buy stop here at that level that I just mentioned. That looks okay. Good till canceled. And we want to do the full amount of 400. So we want to buy back 400 shares if we get a move up into this area. Okay, we're good on that. So again, I'm short the Nikkei. I'm also long gold here, which uh, gold I discussed earlier has just been really boring to watch. If you've been watching gold the last few days, it's like watching paint dry. It's just going sideways. It's not really going anywhere um, too quickly. It's just kind of going sideways. So we will uh, keep an eye on that. Take a look at some other markets here really quick too. We got the dollar index a little bit higher here this morning. The VIX down about 6.75%. Chinese stock market uh, rough here this morning. The Nikkei uh, up about three. You got the Russell up 0.75. You got S&P up 1.2. NASDAQ 1.5, 1.6. And the Dow Jones up about 0.8, 0.9. So yeah, a little bit of a bounce back for stocks. And it is possible that, you know, depending on how this week goes, you could get stocks all over the place. We take a quick look at the S&P 500 as an example. So the, the S&P 500 here put in a really bearish week last week. We saw a huge sell-off following with uh, you know consecutively bearish candles. Uh, I do think this is very, very normal, even if we're going to continue bearish to see some kind of day like this. I mean, it was kind of uh, hindsight here, but it was a little bit due for a bit of a bounce, right? Will that bounce last? We'll see. Is this going to be you know, big higher low? That will be the signal to watch for for the bulls. I think you really confirm that this is a higher low for the bulls if you get a return back to the highs. Right? If you start breaking through structures like this, you know, this level of resistance here, it's very possible that we are moving north again. Um, but until that, it's tricky because, you know, if you take a look at the S&P 500, it's very slight, but we did technically put in what looks to be a potential lower high. That's a little bit early to call because you could be looking at this and say, well, in order for you to really know if that's a lower high, you gotta see a break structure. Because right now this could be one big old long-term kind of consolidation for the S&P 500. That would be you know, appropriate or possible. I know I was listening to Chris Pulver, his Sunday video, he discussed the idea of maybe the S&P 500 here is just gonna go back and retest lows Maybe we're just in a range for a little bit while we wait out the election cycle, while we wait out uh, what the Fed's going to do. It's very possible that you do get some more volatility off the back of the elections. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if September seasonality continues to see a little bit of um, volatility. I currently have no long index positions. I'm only slightly short on my Nikkei 225 position that I just shared with you guys on stream here. Um, if we take out those lows, I would not be surprised to see a push down into the 5250 level for the S&P 500. In fact, I would actually like to see that. That would be my preferred scenario because I'm not necessarily bearish on indices as a whole. Uh, I did just take a short position on the Nikkei, but 
I would say that they're just due for a bit more of a more of a pullback. I could be wrong about that. And if I am, then, you know, that's why we use stop losses. And that's why you can, you know, the beauty of trading is that you can adapt to, you know, what what is showing up in the markets for you. But um, I'm watching the 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 S&P 500. Another one that's interesting is the NASDAQ. Take a look at this. The NASDAQ a little bit more pronounced in its bearish sell off last week. Last week was a horrible week for technology stocks. Um, some of you guys who might have been watching them might have recognized that as well. If you were watching semiconductors, if you were watching the QQQ or the NASDAQ 100 index, my goodness, it was a rough week for tech. And, uh, you know, what I'm looking for here is I do think that a, a bounce is very appropriate, uh, but I'm curious to see if we're going to kind of recapture some areas. You know, are the bulls going to start taking back control here and start pushing through? Or is this going to put in another lower high and continue to go lower? Right. That's the, that's a concern. And I, I think that either ways, a bounce is sort of appropriate in the short run, even if you are bearish. But I'm so, I'm very curious once you start getting into, you know, the four hour chart levels, as you start seeing this thing bounce up into, you know, where we ran into trouble last week. Are you going to get similar reactions? Are we going to see a continued sell here? Uh, or are we going to start recapturing those levels? I think when we take a look at the four hour chart, we get better view here of what could be shaping up to be, you know, maybe a reversal. If you get, you know, break through these levels, 19,000, if we start making a move back confidently into 19,000, then I'm definitely not going to be shorting into that because that looks strong, right? But we'll have to see because these sorts of moves can get very violent uh, to the up and downside in a bearish market. We've discussed this on stream many times. If you're a regular, you know that when we're talking about indices, they can be very violent uh, in downtrends to both directions. So what I mean by that is in a real, if you're going to get a real kind of corrective move for the months leaving, uh, leading up into the election, then this big spike is naturally going to have violent up moves within it, right? So you can see these kind of violent moves to the upside. And it's a very characteristic thing of the of the indices. You can see when we're moving up, you typically get these kind of chugging upward trends with brief pullbacks. But then when you start moving lower, the interesting thing is you get these violent bounces and then violent sell-offs again. So right now, that's the question this week is really watching as we get closer to CPI. Is this going to be kind of a, a rip back rally week, which I would argue would come off of the back of a uh, not threatening soft CPI? Uh, or is there going to be some challenges here? You're going to start to see that consumer price index show signs of inflation not going down anymore. That would be the very bare case for markets right now would be if if inflation were to do something like this. It's not expected. I don't think that's likely to happen, but I'm just saying a scenario in which you get concern in the market. Market analysis, free trading courses, edge finder data, and special offers. What do these things all have in common? They're all available for you right now inside of our free Discord. You can click the link down in the description below to join the free Discord today and get access to all of this and more. Stay up to date with all the latest trading information and A1 content. And if you want to upgrade to our gold VIP Discord that features every single trade that Trader Nick and our other professional analysts take, you can find the links for that in the description as well. So don't wait, go check out the free Discord today. COT data, pull this up. They sold the Nikkei slightly. They sold Dow. They sold a little bit of gold, copper, the 10 year. They sold treasury bonds, by the way. That's what that is. Silver, oil, platinum. This is what they sold. They sold commodities heavy. They sold. Yeah, wow. They sold every commodity on the indices or on the, uh, the edge finder. Heavy selling of commodities. What did they buy? They bought the Canadian dollar, the NZD. They bought the yen, the Russell, the pound, the Aussie, SPX, US dollar, NASDAQ, Euro, South African Rand, a little bit of Bitcoin and a tiny bit of CHF. Uh, so the thing with yens that I really want to get, go over to next is, you know, I just need to come back to pull back on NASDAQ. So those are my two like I'm about to 
do something about very soon. But then the dollar yens or the yens, I saw it this morning. I was like, hey, we have a pullback. Great. Let's do a pullback. And then I left and then I came back and now everything is raised. Yeah, the uh, the yen crosses have been absolutely crazy. I saw them, uh, you know, tank through the lows last week, took out that, uh, you know, that kind of level of support that we're holding. Now, do you think, Ivan, that we will actually break that, that uh, you know, big, scary drop off Monday morning, low August 5th? Do you think we have the chance to, to see the Japanese yen strengthen enough to actually get dollar yen to break those lows? Um, I, <laughs> I have two conflicting thoughts in my head at the moment. One is I believe we're going to fall until 23rd. That's like my theory. But then we are at support now. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I believe we're still going to continue. But also, like, at what level are we at? We are back at what level are we now? We are back at... 20 January 24 24 maybe August 23rd as we are kind of like mid mid 23 uh, beginning of 24 so if we're back down to like 23 level that would be a bit more crazy yeah but yeah, yeah. we've really broken and when we take a look at the yen crosses we've really broken the momentum of this year and, I, and I've discussed this uh, a couple times with you too Ivan but for maybe people who are listening in for the first time Ivan and I discussing this concept with the Japanese yen. Um, you know, it's been just a weak, weak, weak uh, currency for a number of you know years now, actually. And mm. part of that train has been, you know, the high inflation from the United States and other places has led central banks to raising their interest rates. Meanwhile, the Bank of Japan has been steadily dovish during that time, creating a big divergence and creating huge trends in the currency world. But that is changing. Uh, has been changing kind of in front of our eyes here recently with global economies showing some signs of really slowing down and actually looking to reduce their interest rates. Uh, we've started to see that globally, which has uh, put some pressure here and made the yen perhaps a little bit more strong uh, or, or has made it strong in the recent months and perhaps has set up a kind of a, a, a one big kind of mean reversion moment for the mm -hmm. yen. You know, you can take a look at this on a long term daily chart level and you can see we're starting to kind of kind of starting to lose our momentum even on the long term basis. Take a look at the weekly chart here. I don't know. Uh, how far can this thing go down if it wants to, Ivan? How hot is it at the core of the earth? It's pretty hot. I've been there yeah. once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> uh, I have to say that you know it's um, it's very dependent on, of course, growth and inflation in Japan and the course of it, and and it's also dependent on Swiss and how Swiss is moving. So to me, it's more of um, we can definitely break the lows. Also, that there is no question in my mind that that's going to break mostly because when the trend starts and the 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 rate of falling we have at the moment it is definitely possible mm. don't yeah check it out Sorry. yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't even be surprised i mean it, it kind of depends what happens too with the other central banks but you know uh we have the fed coming up uh soon with their mm -hmm. their decision on rates mm -hmm. some people are saying 50 some people are saying 25 basis point cut uh, and for the newbies who don't quite know what that means, basically the Fed cutting interest rates makes borrowing money easier. It's an act to try and make the economy um, or re kind of reaccelerate the economy, get things rolling again. And uh, depending on where the economy is at, they may choose to do a bigger reduction or a 50 basis point rate cut or a smaller reduction in the borrowing cost, 25 basis points, 20 basis points, 0.25 percent. It's just a fancy jargon finance bro way of saying 0.25 percent or 25 basis points anyways um ivan now mm -hmm. here and now point blank mm -hmm. do you think 25 or 50 25. basis points is more likely i'll give 25. you my answer after 25 yeah okay so so ivan is locking in 25 uh that's what i was gonna say too so that that didn't make it very interesting i was hoping you'd say 50 so we could <laughs> 
kind of argue about it. But no, 25 basis points. Um, when you look at what we've got here, on Friday, you had the jobs data come out mm -hmm. and it was not particularly uh, really great or absolutely horrendous. It was leaning not great, but it wasn't, you know, the whole world is falling apart. So I think that that kind of locks in the 25 basis points. And that seems to be what the Fed watch tool is saying. Isn't that right, Ivan? Is that is that right? Um, yeah, I just dropped. I just dropped you to two seconds there. The yeah, seventy three for fifteen. So for right for one for one 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 rate cut on 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 yeah okay next week yeah. So expectations are for a you know a twenty five basis point cut. That's what that seventy three percent number is indicating. So. We'll see if there's any surprises there, but the only thing left, Ivan, between now and then that's really meaningful is the consumer price index. Is there anything that could come out in the producer price index? Is there anything that could come out with inflation this week that would change this story more? Could it possibly do anything? You know, this deal isn't sold to anyone. So don't sell the skin before, before you shoot the bear. Something in the direction. Anyways. Norwegian, English, whatever things. Yes. Um, also if this thing that is called uh, CPI, Consumer Price Index, year over year, August, comes in at three, <laughs> dollar coin is strengthened. Mm. Three or above. Which on one side is 2.6 expected. So that's 0 0.3. So every, anything more than 0 0.2 difference from the expectation is going to create a movement but if it comes at three then also that's a reacceleration and we have been fighting so hard for so long to be below to be below three and we, if we go back up to three it's gonna turn and twist the entire market upside down and that's gonna be very fun yeah yeah the if you get a surprise up move in inflation yes. they're expecting a lot of continued progress there if you get anything surprising there that makes it rough for for markets because then you're suddenly looking down and you're saying okay the market is expecting they're not yes everyone's talking about september's interest rate cuts but the market is expecting a flush of rate cuts in the coming year if you get a bottoming out yet again around the three percent mark for inflation it will really diminish the number of expected rate cuts in the coming 12 months so if inflation doesn't continue to cool off, that will potentially refocus the attention on inflation again, which could slow the pace of rate cuts, which slowing the pace of rate cuts could mean pain for areas that have been desperately waiting for rate cuts, so specifically things like small caps and um, real estate and technology names, etc. We got a big bounce back in stocks today, huh? For sure. Um, I'm debating on playing it a little bit this week. Uh, near term, I was actually looking before uh, I jumped on here with you, Nick. I was looking for maybe a little bit of a butterfly spread today on the ES. Um, I, I ended up, you know, pinning a nice little trade last week on Friday, uh, turned like $7 debit into around $38 credit. So that was a pretty nice return. Um, it, it's, I mean, uh, let, let's just talk basic stuff. So, uh, I heard the, the tail end of your and uh, your conversation with with Elvin, and um, you know, going into this week's trading, let me go to one workspace here. I got lots of them, so let me go into. Uh, is this it? Is this it? This one might be it. <laughs> okay, so the market last week with employment data was pretty rough for the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the market turned sour. You know, Tuesday was a big, big dip to the downside. Wednesday, Thursday, indecisive. Friday, bad to the downside. You know, marks, markets are up a little bit today. They're stabilizing. This week, it's Wednesday, Thursday, inflation data. Uh, it's all going to be about the Fed and what the Fed's likely going to do next week. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. I did a video on this over the weekend. I wouldn't be surprised, Nick, if we end up finding the 200 exponential moving average on the S&P. This is the SPY. We didn't find it. Uh, if you go to the, the futures feed, we just missed it, uh, but we're over 200 bars away. And I have a feeling, I mean, again, feeling is, isn't what I trade, but I have a hunch that this market is going to be giving us some indecision as we go into the election, because I think it's going to give us a lot of volatility. Yes, there's inflation data this week. And yes, there's the Fed next week. And yes, there's six central banks around, you know, September. But 
Then we have another round of employment news and another round of inflation news before we get to the election. Now, tonight at 8 p.m., we do have the first debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Yep. I don't think that's going to be a market mover necessarily, but I will be watching the futures market just in case. Um, but I don't think I would be surprised to see the market not really go anywhere uh, over the next maybe month or so, simply because all this stuff is bubbling and the market just needs an excuse to find a way to rip higher, rip lower. And I don't think it's going to have enough evidence to do that, right? This is still kind of a wait and see approach for where we're going the next couple of months. And um, I don't know. I mean, the 200 EMA is sitting right there, right? I mean, the, it, it, we, we tapped it on the on the NASDAQ. So the QQQ came out and tapped it. Uh, the structure on the NASDAQ looks a little bit different, but we still have higher lows, lower highs. Indecision could certainly be the case over the next little bit. Just a lot of indecision, a lot of volatility. Um, you know, the VIX is up to 20. You go to the Dow. You know, the Dow's making slightly higher lows, but choppy right now. Every time we're poking these highs, we're pulling back. Also, another one that's pretty stretched on this 200 exponential moving average. The Russell, same type of thing. You know, we've been bouncing off the 200 EMA several times. Probably not a bad strategy to look for. Even on the Russell, we come back and find that 200 EMA. I don't think it's a bad spot to look for buying trades. So long story short for me is um, I did take an income trade last week and I put it in on Friday. And this was uh, on SPX. Mm -hmm. And I put in a 5410 uh, by 5405 bull put spread. And all that is is a little income play this week for 205. And if I if I win for one contract, it's 205 bucks. Uh, if I lose, I'm probably going to wait for this area to be tested and put in some more option trades. And this is a one contract. If I win, awesome. Uh, if I lose, then I'm going to do a two contract down here at the 200 EMA. So I'm watching right now that if markets just kind of oscillate the 200 EMA to me is a big spot to be watching for the next kind of short-term buying opportunity. Um, I don't think we're breaking highs anytime soon, Nick. I don't think we're necessarily breaking the August 5th low without having a trap around that. It's support in my opinion right now. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. I saw, I actually watched a little bit of your Sunday video yesterday and yeah, um, I saw kind of what you were talking about, like with your, yeah, no, it was great. And uh, I saw like you're, you're talking about kind of like perhaps we move sideways here. Maybe we see a retest of the August lows. I kind of agree. I think that the market as we are really close to some of these key events, you know, the, mm -hmm. the big uh, anticipated Fed decision, uh, the elections are like the next 60 days here. So you just have a lot of questions. I don't think it is uh, very likely that you just get rip your face off, rips through the through the high. Um, and I also, you know, wouldn't be surprised that there's some dip buying that goes on if you do get lower. Uh, I think short term, I do kind of lean more towards the idea of I think we have some volatility, we have some uncertainty that could cause markets to, you know, move lower. One big kind of concern that I have is it's a lot more prominent on the NASDAQ, but we didn't take out the previous highs with all that really bullish rally that we saw. Is it a potential kind of formation here where we're seeing a bit of a lower high sequence, mm -hmm. which could lead to, again, naturally, um, some sell pressure, some some uncertainty in this market. So, Chris, uh, you know, Frank and I were talking about this this morning, and you know, this is one of my favorite conversations is how do I like to short the market if I'm bearish or uncertain about it? And um, you know me, I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very conservative and cautious with my trading stuff. I don't like to get big old short on the market when I'm bearish on it. Uh, it's a tricky trade. Um, I know you also have your creative ways of approaching it. For me, my creative way of approaching it is staying pretty cash heavy, maybe looking to trade commodities, looking to trade gold, etc. But I did take a very rare appearance uh, short position on an index. What? I really shorted, no I know. I no shorted way. the Nikkei. Um, I was explaining to Frank, I was like, if we get volatility, where do I want to be? Well, you could short SMH if you want to get even more volatility. Well, comparable volatility. But the Nikkei sold off 27.5% mm -hmm. in like a week. So to me, it's like, is that going to happen again? Probably not. That was kind of a, a margin call freak event. Right. But is there a lot of uncertainty and fresh fear over there after that? I would say so. We saw last NFP caused a big sell-off. If I'm going to get bearish on an index, I've got to see, first of all, um, you know, the right setup. But also, uh, the Edge Finder gave me this, this kind of extra confidence here this morning just to look at the Nikkei. I decided, okay, I don't really want to short U.S. indices because they're just the top tier indices. And that's just hard to, hard to fight them. But the Nikkei, which, again, sold off massively last month out of everything, you know, 
I don't hate the idea of just a, a quick stop if I'm wrong and uh, maybe looking for the rollover if if indices want to take a bit more of a break. So um, that's kind of where I'm at. But again, still sticking. It's a small position, still sticking to my traditional ways of shorting the market or staying cautious, which is just keeping cash heavy. And if I do enter, maybe looking at more defensive sectors. You know, um, in the last few months, Chris, utilities, uh, financials, um, staples have been doing quite well. Meanwhile, you've got what what is what is your money done for you? If you've sat waiting in SMH all year long, well, it may surprise some listeners to hear that I believe that we are just barely in the green for the year on uh, on semis. I mean, it's it is in the green. Let me hold on. Let me semis. Now, this one is the one that's weighted heavily towards NVIDIA. So you still Absolutely. had a good year here. But if you take a look at like SOXX, you can see here that uh, through January, it's not that impressive. You know, if you put if you take out NVIDIA from the picture, Mm-hmm. which is up is like you know what three figures this this year uh over 100 percent. also giving a decent amount back yeah it's it's also given a, a good bit back but if you're just taking along on the semis or if you traded xlk this year xlk has been good but still you know you've given back massive amounts of your gains here's january till now see it's up seven and a half at one point it was up well uh, let's call it 25 percent. it was it was up big so um yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think that the 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 chart has broken a little bit. The the easy uptrend has has been showing signs of slowing. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm just I'm staying cautious. But uh, um, yeah, just just my thoughts on it. I want to also ask you really quick about the dollar index, gold, mm-hmm. any of those, currency world. What are you seeing there? Dollar index uh, bouncing off its lows here, but still taking a big beating here recently. Yeah, I mean the dollar's been been garbage the last couple of months as the market priced in the you know the pace of the cuts and when the cuts are finally coming. Um, but one thing that kind of changes that tune right away is uh, this week the ECB is forecasted for a 0.6 percent cut on mm. Wednesday. That's a yeah. big chunk, man. I mean we're we're going back and forth on 25 basis points and 50 basis points. I think you and I would agree that if the Fed does cut by 50 basis points in September it's probably not a good thing for the stock market. Yeah. I think 50 basis points historically has always been a bad thing when they cut aggressively going into, we're in a recession. That's that's pretty much what the Fed would be telling and admitting to the market. Um, but if the ECB on the other hand is like, we're gonna cut 0.6%, um, I think that gives the, I, I think it gives a decent floor in the near term for the, for the dollar to, to rally. Um, the only true correlation with the dollar index has been Euro dollar. You know, is this, is this dollar index has made lower highs, lower lows, the Euro dollar flipped this around. You can see Euro dollar, pretty much the exact opposite, making higher highs and higher lows. Uh, but we recently turned off this major 112 uh, resistance area. And although I'm not short right now, I think the DXY is a better, oops, the DXY is a better trade for me in the near term to say, look, if I'm liking this dollar here, stop loss below, you know, if we just eat back into this structure around 102.50 to 103, I think that's a near term trade. So if this is holding the lows, uh, I mean, obviously we could deal with just some some chopping here, but I wouldn't be surprised after months of selling that the dollar just pulls back a little bit, finds some structure. And then this is the area that I would say, okay, if the dollar bears really want to rip this thing lower, then that's where I'm looking for the drop. Because if they get through this 103 handle, I'm sorry to say it, Nick, but this dollar is probably going to be more resilient than people want. And it yeah. was a good run, but it was a tricky freaking run, man. Like the dollar index was pretty clean to the downside, but I can't just trade the dollar index. I had to go find currency pairs and they didn't look like this. Euro dollar was fine. Pound dollar was okay, but the other ones were literally like ups and downs and then finally caught this and then flash and then caught that. They were all over the place, like Aussie dollar, New Zealand dollar, dollar CAD, dollar Swiss, uh, dollar yen, of course, is just doing its own thing. So the dollar has not been the easiest basket to trade, although this analysis seems like pretty clean. So I think dollar in the near term looks decent for support. Um, I, I will keep going back and repeat this over and over again for the last couple months. If we're going to see a stronger stock market by the end of the year, I do think the dollar has to get a lot weaker. So yeah. I like dollar weakness. Um, I'm just not ready to say you know, to a couple ways, right? If I believe in dollar weakness, I could be short now, small, short here, stop loss above, and then go after you know fresh lows or hit the same lows again. And then if we can break fresh lows, now we're talking dollar weakness into you know a symmetry play around like 95 or 94 so there's plenty of room to downside in the dollar i guess the the only hesitation i have is you have six central banks that are likely making some moves this month and the bank of japan although they're not 
uh holding rate you know the hold rates at probably 0.25 but the, the fed's going to cut most likely ecb looks like they're cutting in a bigger way uh bank of england swiss national bank if all these banks start cutting I, I don't know if that's good or bad for the dollar necessarily, but it brings everyone back in line with all the central, central banks are turning dovish, you know, so yeah. it, it could just be a lot of uh, of chop. And so I don't know, I'm, I, I, I like, if, especially in Forex, I like trading wide open spaces and yeah. I don't really have it. So if this is a near term trade, stop loss below going after the midpoints and, and some of this structure, that's about it in the near term. But the bigger picture is if we turn bearish, there's lots of space to the downside in the dollar. I just have to see a little bit of confirmation. That's all. Did you know we do a live trading show Monday through Friday with guests from all over the world? To get notified when we go live, click the bell button next to the subscribe button or check in at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time. We have helpful free content in the description below and on our website, a1trading.com. Thanks for watching today's video and we'll see you tomorrow.